What is going on, everyone? And welcome back to the greatest podcast in the world, baby. That is shooting the shit uncensored. And you know who this is. It's the truth. The dad bod god, the ball, the beard, and the bloody beautiful Piers Austin. And tonight... Man, we got a special one for all of you guys. We have the governor himself, Ben Edwards, former world champion, former Muay Thai fighter, former MMA fighter, now working with Enduro Fight Series, putting on some amazing fights coming up on July 29th in Canberra, which I'm going to be commentating. And we're going to find out possibly who my commentary partner for that show is going to be. Maybe tonight. I don't know. We'll get into it with Ben and much, much more. But before we do, I need to take a quick second, a quick pause for that cause to thank our sponsor for tonight's episode. And that is, of course, sleeves.com. That's S-L-E-E-F-S, sleeves.com. Listen, if you or someone you know is an athlete, you need to go and check out sleeves.com. And when I say athlete, you can also be someone that goes to the gym regularly. I go to the gym like four or five times a week. I wouldn't say I'm an athlete, but I get out there. Now, listen, go and check out sleeps.com. They've got all your gear and wear covered. They've got armbands, compression pants, compression shorts, headbands, boots, mouth guards, and they've even got those dirty boxes that you know I'm always rocking. And these dirty boxes are the most comfortable boxes that I own, bar none. Seriously, I told Mrs. Austin, get rid of any boxes that ain't dirty boxes, baby. And she actually thought I meant like dirty one. Anyway, regardless, these dirty boxes are the shit. They stay dry. They stay fresh. They got funky designs on the front to keep that special person in your life giggling at the end of the day when that belt buckle comes undone. So do yourself a favor. Go get yourself some of those dirty boxes. Head over to sleeps.com. Use that promo code MWAPOD to get a 10% discount at your final purchase. Also, wherever you are tuning in, if you are tuning in on YouTube, please like, share, subscribe, hit the bell to stay notified, tap that little red button and tap in because you know we are bringing you some of the best interviews, conversations in the world of professional wrestling, boxing, MMA, Muay Thai, comedy, music, you name it, we bring it to you here on the Piers Austin channel. Also, if you're listening on a podcast platform, please give us a five-star review. It helps with our analytics, and it helps us bring more amazing conversations to more amazing fucking people like yourselves. So get to clicking and get to tapping in because you know we're delivering. Woo! Man, it's always good to get all of that fun stuff out of the way, but the really fun stuff is just about to begin. But I'll tell you what. You've seen me talk enough shit to myself. So let's get in to my conversation with the one, the only, Ben, the governor, Edwards, baby. Hey guys, welcome back to Shooting the Shit Uncensored. I am here with one of my favorite people in the entire world, and I know I say that about everyone I have on this show, but this time I actually mean it. Ben the Governor, Edward Woods, welcome to Shooting the Shit. Pleasure to have you on, brother. Thanks very much for having me, mate. It's quite the intro. I might have to get you in the cage being the MC as well. (laughs) Hey, man, I'm... I'm down for whatever you want me to do, brother, on, on, on show night, man. I, I, I'm eager and keen to do whatever I can, bro. Uh, man, you know, talking about, you know, show night, you know, July 29th, uh, you know, big show for Enduro Fight Series. Uh, you guys are putting on, man, like I've I've seen some of the, the fights that are coming on. I'm getting excited for it because I am actually getting to call the action. Uh, but, man, how, how hard has this card been? to put together and how long has this show been in the making for? 
I uh, started working on this straight after the last one. So December last year, um, this one, you know, touch wood has been great to organize so far. The last one was, was really difficult. We lost like eight fights, uh, like within three weeks of, of the event. So I ended up, I had to book 16 fights and we ended up with eight. So at the moment we've got 11 and um, there's three professional fights, two title fights, our for inaugural heavyweight titles on the line between uh, Jack Alexander and uh, Queanbeyan local Dean Maxwell, which should be an absolute cracker. Jack yeah. Alexander's debut like on an enduro two was just awesome. You know, round one stoppage over a super tush, a super tough uh, DJ Tamapal. And uh, we've got, uh, you know, Daniel Curtis's debut against Fame Mosquito, two amateur female world champions making their pro debuts. That's, wow. You know, it's not even really arguably, it's the two best amateur females on the planet making their pro debuts. So it's, it's the card stacked from, from top to bottom. It's going to be going to be awesome, mate. So this will be our, our fourth show. The first three sold out. This one's going to as well. So uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's really looking good. And, you know, so the, the amateur fights that we're, you, you're looking to have on this show as well, like what are the sort of um, competitors like that you're putting on this show from that amateur thing? Because so, from <clears throat> the Juro is like, this is like top notch, you know, from production, fight card, everything put into it. So I'm assuming these amateurs are like the ones that are on the cusp of going pro, like you mentioned about the two ladies. Yeah, right? we've got all of the above, mate. We, we've got we've got amateurs that have only had one or two fights. We've got a few guys making yeah. their debuts, and we've got a few pretty seasoned amateurs that are on the verge of uh, turning pro and looking at doing big things on the world scene. But the best thing about this has been, it's, you know, the whole premise of like um, us running Enduro was to give, you know, Canberra fighters uh, a platform to perform at home. And of the 22 fighters we've got on this card, only three of them are local. And we've still managed to sell out. So usually we wanted to do like half the card ACT in Queanbeyan versus New New South Wales and Victoria. But um, it's, it's the busiest time of year to run a fight show. So it's been really difficult locking in uh, ACT fighters. We don't have the deepest talent pool given the size of our yeah. state naturally. So it's just been, you know, I've got to, got to give a big big shout out to uh, MMA FFT, Mixed Martial Arts Family Fight Team, headed up by Renato Subatic. He's got, he's got, I think he's got four fighters on and then there's Rival mm-hmm. Gym headed up by Shane Parker. He's got like five fighters on the card. So those two gyms have just contributed so much to the show. And, yeah. and Shane, like he's been, this is the first, second time he's put fighters on our show. And I think it's going to be the first time he's actually going to come and corner his, his fighters. But he's got guys on there that are given up a lot of experience. And they're like, mate, we'll jump in and have a crack. So it's, it's what it used to be when I first started. Like I had 10 fights in my first eight months. There was no... Um, oh, you know, you can't fight that guy who's too experienced. There was, was none yeah. of that. It was just, just jump in, have a crack and see how you go. And and your stock is as good as your last fight. It doesn't matter if you, if you lost two or three fights out of 10 fights. If you go in and you have a crack and you're losing close decisions against good fighters, your stock doesn't isn't damaged at all. And no, it's, it's, been great, it's been great sort of reliving that attitude a bit because there's a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of gyms out there that are really protective of their fighters' records, even as, as amateurs. I, I get mm-hmm. it as a pro. You want to be selected with... with of course, fight. yeah. But um, with the amateurs, you just got to get the experience and get in the cage, get the cage time in. And mm. you know, between those two gyms, they've, it's been awesome. You know, they've really helped out a lot putting this card together. I suppose, like, you know, the, that's probably the one big difference. Like when you look at, say, boxing, for example, as opposed to like MMA and Muay Thai, where I think boxing, I think fight cards take probably a lot longer to get together because of. Do you think like it's because there are certain gyms that are trying to protect? And I'm not saying let's name anyone's names, but trying to protect fighters' records and stuff like that. Boxing especially. Like, everyone's notorious. Like, you know, they're trying to get a fighter to a world title. Everyone's like 20 and 0, 25 and 0. And out of those 20 fights, they've probably had like three or four difficult fights. And and there's a lot of tournament in between there, you know. And that's really been a a, done a disservice to boxing. Where you look at MMA, it's the best guys fighting the best guys all the time. Yeah. And you that you know like they may not they may not win all the time but they're crowd favorites they're making money they're putting bums on seats they're entertaining mm. you know everyone wants to see them fight you know and Pacquiao and Mayweather is a great example that fight happened six years too late and then there's a bunch of different examples of that boxing I think is actually learning some lessons you know they put mm. on Tank Davis and uh, Ryan Garcia you know when it should have happened which was really good and now yeah. they've got um you know Terence Crawford and uh, Errol Spencer coming up as well so they're, they're two examples of boxing actually taking a, you know, learning some lessons from MMA 
and uh, really, you know, putting on the big fights when they should happen. You know, not just not just che- not just cherry picking opponents and trying to keep that uh, zero intact. Well, that's where what MMA has done for years. Like you look over the 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 years of, of MMA in its existence, it's always almost been the top. Like let's take UFC one for example. What was the final? Ken Shamrock versus Royce Gracie. That's the biggest rivalry in in, in yeah. combat sports, right? So, yeah. you know, I so, feel yeah. like in stuff like that. But do you feel like with boxing tournaments, it's easy, it's hard for them to sort of try and protect their fighters in certain yeah areas. look i don't know if it's if it's like an old business model because I, I think the, the the original thought process was um a, a sanctioning body just say the wbc they don't want to have yeah. a world champion uh win their belt for the first time with three or four or more losses on his record because it makes them look bad i, I just I don't, I don't know what it is who cares if you got five losses on on, on his record if, mm. if he if he learned those lessons from those five fights and he's come back, and he's he's now he's he's twenty and five, but he's a world class fighter. I mean, who cares if he's got losses on his record? A hundred percent. You win or you learn. Every every loss I had, man, I came back. I was a way better fighter for the experience. And I, I think boxing is slowly adjusting, but it's just it's it's an old, you know, in Australia as well, which I've experienced personally, but also on the world stage, it, it, it is a bit of a boys club. It's it's a well established mm. generational uh, control over boxing, and. Um, but, you know, competition is, is the best f- f- for all businesses, you know, and I think Hulk okay. is really learning that lesson now. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at, um, you know, you know MMA, for example, and we talk about, you know, wins and losses, we recently saw, um, oh, I can't pronounce his name, the South African guy just won on. Uh, Lucas Duplessis. Yes. Uh, you know, he, he made comments in regards to, you know, where he was at in regarding to being an underdog and stuff like that. And he said, well, of course I'm an underdog. Yes, Whitaker's coming off a, a loss to ex-fighter, but look at his record for the past 10 years. Okay, he, 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 he lost one fight to the guy who's cleaned house how many times? Like, yeah. fuck, yeah. <laughs> you know, who He's- hasn't been beaten that by that guy? So how can you yeah. say he's any less of a, a champion or a fighter or whatever? Yeah, exactly right. Well, I think Whitaker's thing was he's only lost to a guy called Israel Adesanya since 2014. <laughs> that's the guy he's lost to. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty amazing record. But the UFC does that all the time, and that's why they got a they got a big pay per view every month, 12, 12 a year. They got a show pretty much every every weekend. You know, they might have like four or five off throughout the year, but that's an incredible amount of content. And mm. you know, they've got nearly eight hundred fighters on the roster. I think too. You know, yeah. so it's just boxing's really they, they've got to start catching up. Like obviously the paydays of the, the high end of boxing are just incredible, but mm. uh, you got to understand the UFC. What's thirty years old now? Boxing's been around for over a hundred years. You give the UFC the time, and now they'll, they'll be catching up for sure. But do you think boxing would would ben- be more beneficial if they went for more of like the UFC sort of route, whereas like instead of like the governing bodies like the WBC, the IBA, the IBOs and all that became organizations and then started putting fighters down on contracts? But I suppose that, like, then you're going to miss out if you've got all these governing bodies now promotions. Yeah, yeah. That's- well, that, that's the thing though. There's like there's four UFCs in boxing essentially. There's this four like world-class um, – you know, you got WBC, the WBO. You know, it's the ABC yeah. soup. I don't even know, and I'm a professional boxer. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, in the I mean, UFC, it's the UFC. If you're the UFC yeah. champ, you're the best guy in the world. There's, there's no doubt about it. But they're never mm. going to relinquish that power um, and the money that they're making. You know, obviously the the WBC is held in the highest regard um, out of those four belts. But still, you know, if you're the WBC, you're never going to relinquish that power of of merging all four of the top belts together. I just, I just can't see it ever happening. Mm. It's just people are not, not going to want to let go of something that is such a huge breadwinner for them. The, which the only thing is great for, great for MMA because MMA is just going to keep doing what it's doing, you know? Mm. I think, you know, boxing, as, as you said earlier, you know, with now sort of getting the fights – when you want to see him as opposed to six years or eight years too late, yeah. maybe that is the younger generation of boxing promoters and, and mindset coming in saying like, holy shit, like we got to pull our finger out here because MMA is slowly taking over and, you know, yeah. other stuff is starting to appear like BKFC is now like, you know, yeah. booming in, in the world of content and stuff. And, so and they're making money in that too. I think Luke Rockhold got like, you know, as announced he made, and, you know, this could be, you know, 
bullshit. But yeah, I'm you, got, you got a couple hundred, like seven hundred thousand dollars for that fight against Mike Perry too. You know, I read yeah. that on the underground, so a twelve year old kid could have posted it, but it seemed legit. <laughs> yeah, man. Look, I, I don't know what these guys uh, would be earning, to be honest. But like, I'd I'd hope for like the bare knuckle thing, which is kind of like. How is that proven now, like, any different concussion-wise to, like, an MMA glove or, a, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just hope that the damage isn't as significant. I hope the pay is more significant than what the damage is causing. That well, I'm going to put my bro science hat on now, and I'm going to say that I think the actual, you know, the damage to the skin and the cuts and all that are obviously horrific. Everyone looks like they've been run over by a lawnmower after, mm. like, a, you know, a, a tightly contested fight. But... You know, if I'm fighting someone bare knuckle, I'm not going to be hitting as hard because I'm going to be worried about breaking my hand. 100%. So I don't know. I think I'm just going to be trying to land more sh shorter, sharper shots and just try and, you know, potentially get ahead on points because if I'm throwing bombs, I'll break mm. my hand 100%. So my bro science hat would say, I don't know if the brain damage is going to be as bad. I just think the structural damage and the optics of having someone's mm. face just looking like a mush is way worse and less palatable to the general public, which I don't think bare knuckles ever going to get there. You know, the UFC still still considered, you know, look, look at Volkanovski. He's, he's the pound for pound number one. He's such a great ambassador for the sport. He, he's, he's the king of mm. arguably the, the most challenging division and gave, you know, Makashev arguably beat him. The, the, you know, if anyone else is the pound for pound number one, it's him. And the Australian oh, media gives him barely any love, like Fox Sports do a little bit, but... You know, he's such a great ambassador for the sport, but they just, they still, it's like it's the 90s and it's just, oh, it's just human cockfighting and all that stuff. They're so, so behind on everything. So Ben Knuckles got no chance of, of becoming uh, mainstream, especially uh, anytime soon, especially in Australia. But oh, no. Well, they can't, they can't, be. they can only hold bare knuckle fights, I think, in Melbourne, I was told. Oh, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Like yeah Mexico, seems like the, Mexico like seems like the, <laughs> the most down place for any combat ever. Like, it's Where is that? Uh, Melbourne. Oh, Victoria? Yeah, right. Victoria. Yeah, well, that's, oh, why no, no, that's, where, that's where kickboxing really started, you know, in, in Australia yeah. with, you know, Longanides and, and all that sort of thing. So it's a thing. It's the thing that's right that it starts down there. Yeah. Yeah. But it's cra it's crazy. I actually interviewed um the BKFC featherweight champion Kai Stewart, and I was saying to him the same sort of thing. I was like, man, like you know, in a contested fight, man, a couple of guys look pretty cut up and stuff like that. He said, yeah, but you know what? Like, he goes, honestly, he goes, if they didn't tape this part of the hand and they just taped the wrist, he goes, there would be so many less cuts. He goes, most of the cuts that I get is like getting cut from the the athletic tape and stuff like that. Yeah, right. Like, and I was like, really though? Like, because. Yeah. Like, I'd imagine that would be like wet down a fair bit, like yeah. I've never yeah. gone anything close to those, those kind of wraps. I'd be terrible at bare knuckle. My hands are, um, I've got a bad. You get, I'm really jealous. Like you look at the shape of my hand, my index finger protrudes. It'd be terrible. I'm getting arthritis <laughs> for sure. And um, yeah. but you, you see guys where their hands are just like dead flat. And I, yeah. I think for them, that the bare knuckle's perfect for them. I think Mike Perry's like he's that guy, like. Not the best boxer, not the best MMA guy, but bare knuckle, and he's, he's, he's a tough man. Yeah. yeah, it's just perfect for him. So it's good. It's good that there's guys out there like that that, that are super tough guys, awesome mm -hmm. fighters. But maybe that that rule set really really suits them a lot better because it certainly wouldn't suit me if I uh, if I wanted to go the bare knuckle route. I'd be out for a year afterwards, healing my hands up for sure. Yeah, because I would thought I, I would have thought the same thing. I was like, man, how many times did you break your hands in a year? Like before your hands just become like glass. You know what I mean? Like I, I, that, that's the way I was looking at it. I think because I'm 41 years of age now, I probably look at things a little bit differently than I did when I was like young and stupid and probably running yeah. around punching brick walls. You know? Well, so. you know, like when I was fighting, when when I started getting worried about getting injured, that's when I retired. I didn't care. I was I was all in, a hundred percent. I did plenty of research on CTE, pugilistic dementia, you know, all of the above. And I was all in. I didn't care. I was in. But when you start getting worried about getting injured and you're worried about hurting your hands, you're worried about arthritis and you're, you're thinking about five years down the track, you got to get out of there, man. Because sooner or later you're going to run into a kid who's, you know, 20 years old, 25, lives for it, mm -hmm. and is willing to, willing to sacrifice his body to, to, to I, I, And wants to prove a point. And to you know get a name off your name, bro. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, hundred percent. 
and that's how the fight game is. You see, like for years, you know, like some fighters just go, "Yeah, I want that guy." And it's like, but did you? Was that after? Like, did you have children around that time? Like, was there something that happened that was a changing aspect for you? Mate, it was was weird, man. I um, I used to work at a high school. I'm still a youth worker uh, today, but I just had one kid ask me after my last fight in uh, which was the eighth of August. 2019 for the PFL in Atlantic City. Um, just had a kid ask me when my next fight was, and I just said, "Oh, you know, I don't know. I'll, you know, I'm having a bit of a break, and I'll let you know." And then I just went home and just thought, just popped in my head, like, "Yeah, I don't need to do this anymore. I'm good. I've uh, I've got a job that I that I enjoy. There's uh, there's room to grow with that job. I can you know potentially start my own business, which is what I have done. And uh, I just I didn't need I didn't need to didn't need to do it anymore. But for the previous 15 years. That thought never entered my head once. And so I just sat, sat on it for two weeks and, um, yeah, made the call and retired and I haven't looked back since. I've thought about it for a few seconds here and there and then I was like, yeah. no way. Then I just start thinking about the potential injuries and the concussions and, look, I've had a million concussions, you mm. know. And, you know, my bro science hat again would say I've got a huge head, uh, big neck, so I probably should be right, but I wouldn't. <laughs> we'll see how we go. Yeah, but you know what as well? Like I feel, you know, if you get to that point as well and you don't have to train X, you know, like seven days a week and, you know, don't have to starve yourself to – I'm not sure if you had to sort of cut weight um, down yeah. from heavy to heavyweight, but like, you know, I mean, all that sort of stuff that goes into it, it's, it's – and I've said this before, like I really feel like the life of a fighter is a very selfish life to a lot of people it's like exactly because it's like you're getting in there you can't go into a fight unprepared you go into a fight unprepared you might as well just get down on a knee and just take the 10 you know what i mean like and and it can be a life-changing thing that's why i can't get into other sports because there's just there's no consequences oh you let a goal in a guy scored a point who cares man if it it's in fighting if, if if i knock somebody out i can change that person's life you know I know there's one dude I, I, I fought, he's deaf in one ear, his short-term memory's rattled, and that's a life-changing thing. Like, that's yeah. that's awful. But that's what's on the line when you're fighting. So, you know, if you've got a girlfriend who's doing your head in, going into a fight, get rid of her, man, because it, it could change your life. Like, it could affect your your physical health, you know, in, in a big way. And that's yeah. why if you, if you can find the right person, you know, the right girlfriend or, you know, boyfriend for, for the female for or whatever it is, you know, 2023, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, you gotta, you gotta have a very understanding person to, um, to, to share the, the fighting life with, with, with you. Yeah. Cause I, I remember like when I was in 2012, I was gearing up to go and fight MMA and I was training. I was everything like that, got injured, fuck my knee, had to pull out. Yeah, you know, and I was devastated. Came back, you know, in between 2012 and 2014, met my my now wife. 2014 was like, yeah, I'm going to start training again. Got married early 2015. Yeah, training, training, trying to have a kid. Then I'm just like, you know what? I'm so paranoid about re-injuring my leg. I'm so, like, I'm not actually enjoying coming here and training. I'm not actually having fun, and I'm yeah. actually – do not like the people like the person who's training me. Yeah. Why am I like like I I hate this. Why am I doing this to myself? And I went, you know what? Realistically, you're how old? I was probably 33, 34. Gonna have a first pro fight or come on, man. Real yeah. like I yeah, I, mean, I, t- I looked at the realistically going, I've got a good job, good thing here. I'm about to have a family. Maybe yeah. I'll just Train a couple of days here and there, and just not have that mentality of fighting, and just because it's 100%. like some, there was something there. It was just like I'm, I don't want, want this anymore. Yeah, but that's cool. Like, common, common sense. <laughs> but it is, man. Like, do you see that with some fighters that come in? Like, whether it might be they come back from an injury, but they just go, man. Like they come back, and there's just something missing once they get back in there. You know what I mean? Well, some fighters when they get injured are never the same again. Whether they're They've they've lost their their confidence. You know, a lot, a lot of young young men think. You know, we we all think we're invincible for you know periods of time, especially as a teenager, especially before our brains are fully developed. But some people are just never the same after they're injured, and even if they're fully one hundred percent recovered, they could be a little gun shy and worried to injure it again, or they could just be um, just hesitant to fully engage to risk getting injured again. So. 
Yeah. You know, and again, and more, these are all reasons why it's, it's, a, it's a young person's game. And, mm. uh, you know, you, you physically, you know, what's your physical physical prime? You know, probably 18, 20. But they reckon, like, oh, I think a good age for a fighter, and especially as a heavyweight, as we mature physically a little bit later, I reckon about 30 is, is about prime time for a heavyweight. I think it's a bit longer. I think the lighter you are, the earlier, the younger you can peak because you've been that size a little bit longer. More bro science on my behalf. But, you know, if you're if you're not well and truly established by your mid-20s, I think you've probably left it a little bit too late. And, and that's what I did with my MMA career. I, you know, I made the switch when I was 33. I wanted to make the switch when I was 27, but my management team talked me out of it. And, you know, I, I, I'll live with that and then that's fine. I'm at peace with it. But, um. You know, especially the UFC, they always they always push the narrative of we want young guys with the ambition to be a world champion. We don't want old, tough guys that can put on exciting fights. You know, yeah. that's more for like Bellator and, and other things like that. The UFC's narrative is always we want young guys wanting to be world champions. And I think when I tried out for the uh, Ultimate Fighter, they, they weren't even really paying attention. It was a really weird experience. I think they just saw my age on a piece of paper. And they just like, no, nah, this guy's too old. And they just looked at the guys that were in their twenties and just selected them instead. What what year was uh, the Ultimate Fighter? Uh twenty nineteen. I tried out for Tough Twenty Eight. Okay. And, um, the Spanish dude one that Ben Sassoli was on. Ben Sassoli and I were, were over there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a weird thing. Like it wasn't even like I wanted to fight in to get into the house. Oh, let's just have a fight. And then they said, oh, we're going to get you to hit pads in front of some UFC selectors. And Mick Maynard was there. And then it was, you're just going to have a grapple with someone. And so they, they parted, partnered me up with this 145 kilo guy who had to get to 120 kilos if he was to make the show that started six weeks later. Jeez. And we just had like a bit of a wrestle. And mate, I'm not a wrestler. All my wrestling is defensive wrestling so I can get back yeah. on my feet and strike. That's my bread and butter. And so I, I kept escaping all these positions, but the optics was that he was just put me in a position, I escape. He put me in a position, I escape, he, you know. Yeah, you weren't, not you, weren't, you weren't attacking. You were on the no, back. No, I'm not, I'm not going to attack anyone. Everything I ever did was defensive wrestling and defensive jiu-jitsu to get back on my feet. I didn't want to sub anyone. I wanted to knock people out, man. I've been striking professionally for 15 right. years. Oh, 100%. So the whole thing was just a bit ugly. But again, they just look at the thing like 33, this guy's too old to invest in. Let's look at the guys that are less than 25. And I think it was as simple as that. Wow. Yeah. The the overall experience though for the tryout, like, did they just have you, as you said, just hitting pads and just grapple with the guy? Was we, there- we didn't even hit pads. They they just did the grappling thing, and they just told us on the day. Like, it was it made honestly, it was a bit of a shit show. It was it was really poorly done, and there was like a hundred people there, and they'd already had their minds made up of who they wanted on the show. Mm. Uh, I'm convinced of it. They weren't even playing. Mick Maynard was there, sort of playing on his phone, and it was just a, a really. I think it was just more of a formality to make it look like they were, you know, giving us an opportunity to try out when they'd already had their mind out, mind up who they wanted to be on the show. Did you yeah. get selected to try out or was it just no, like- no, 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 my, my, my town got together. We, we set up a, uh, a GoFundMe and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people in Canberra that donated money to get me over to Vegas. Uh, like that was awesome. Like the, the community oh. support that I had was, was, was beautiful. And I uh, got over there, and then th- that happened. It was just really disappointing. Yeah, that's ha- that's heartbreaking, man. Because I feel like even then, like to go through all of that and to have people back you, and like to yeah, yeah as I, uh, I can see why you'd have a little bit of a sour taste after the experience. Yeah, but like, I'd rather them just say, "Look, we're we're, we're not. We, we think you're too old to invest in. We're looking at guys under twenty five. Um, we're not going to select you." Rather than wasting you know, the hundreds of people that donated money to get me over there, wasting their money. A hundred percent. Like even then that probably would have been like, even then, like to get yourself over there and to pay that, they should have at least looked at it and gone, well, fuck this guy's obviously hungry because he's paying X amount of thousands of dollars to get over yeah. here. Like He's yeah. got people that are backing him. So let's have, you know what I mean? Like yeah, at least just, I look at it would be like, as that would take fighting out, but a business sense would be like, Okay, this guy really wants wants this. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and if you look at my my resume, you know you got Australian heavyweight boxing champion K one and Glory. Like there's there's a storyline there. Like there's I'm going to be bringing uh I was going to be bringing an audience from fight sports. You know, so but anyway, I'm a piece of it. It's all good. 
Oh, they're lost. Like, <laughs> <think. laughs> they're lost, man. But like after that, did that leave a, a sour taste in your mouth regarding the sport? Like, did you feel that way that it was age related straight away? Like, yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, I just I just sitting there in the hotel room afterwards, and I felt felt pretty uh, deflated. Um, actually, that was 2018. The tryouts were sorry. Um, but uh, no, no, I still had two more fights after that, and I was all in and had one more fight in Canberra. And then I had uh, the PFL fight after that. And then, uh, then yeah, then I was done. And you know what? Maybe if I uh, made the UFC, I might have been done two more fights anyway. So maybe they made the right call by, by not putting me on, you know, because I did retire two fights later. But maybe if I was in the UFC on, on the bigger platform, I think a big part of it was for me was I'd been throwing money at, at this passion of mine for 15 years. Like I would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on training and travel and all of the above o- over the years. And um, I just I just thought I couldn't, it just wasn't a logical decision to make anymore. Like I've got to stop throwing money at this. I have a, another source of income. I have a job that I love and I have, you know, a job that's very rewarding and I, it's, I get a lot of the same positive feedback, you know, yeah. things that I used to get from fighting. So. It actually, it actually worked out, worked out well, but it would have been interesting to say. I think if I would have made the UFC, I'd probably still be going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure, man, for sure. Um, how did you originally first get into combat sports? So, like Muay Thai and fighting, like what was it? So, yeah, I, I used to hang out at the martial arts shop all the time, and uh, I bought UFC eight David versus Goliath, where Don Fry won the tournament. Yeah, and. Uh, I just, mate, I couldn't believe what I was watching. It was 1998 when I watched it, so I was 14. Loved it, but I was playing rep footy for the Junior Raiders at the time, and you know, footy was my life for like 15 years. And then uh, when footy got serious, and I played for the the Raiders Juniors and stuff, I didn't. I wasn't a confident kid, and I didn't really fit well into that environment of really confident teenagers. I just, I just wasn't. I just, I, by the time I got serious, I'd had enough. And so when yeah. I was 19, I uh, just made the switch and walked into a gym here in Canberra, which was the underground gym. Um, now it's, yeah, one of the, the many club lines. Um, and just started kickboxing because there wasn't any MMA uh, in Canberra. There was like a, a jiu-jitsu school or something, but there was there was like no wrestling. It was all separate. Yeah. And yeah. so I just started kickboxing. And then, I, you know, then I discovered K1. I'm like, this is awesome. This suits me to a T. Let's, let's do that. And then, um, yeah, you know, the K1 Oceani was doing pretty well back then. Mark Hunt, Ray Serfo were, were doing big things. And, um, yeah, started with K1 and started flirting with boxing as well and, you know, made my debut with Hopper and, you know, got that win. I got a lot of notoriety out of that and, yeah. yeah. So Hopper was your debut, right? Hopper was my boxing, professional boxing debut, my <laughs> boxing debut, yeah. We and sort like- of stitched him up though. We um, so I had a fight with uh, this dude called Eric Nusso. He's, he's, he's a good mate of mine. Yeah. Uh, we went and so I, my weight. I only ever trained when I had a fight coming up. So I my weight fluctuated my whole career. Off. So yeah. this fight, I was a hundred kilos. It was two thousand and six Manly Leagues Club. Uh, Eric and I were. I was winning the first two rounds, and in the third round, he dropped me twice. And then I got up, and but I was, you know, I wasn't hitting real hard. I was way too light for for my frame. Yeah, and that's yeah, the video yeah. we showed Hopper, and we're like, "Hey, you want to fight this kid from Canberra? You know, he doesn't hit very hard. He's chinny, blah blah blah." So I put on fifteen kilos. He got the fight done, and uh, felt a million bucks going into the fight, and yeah, knocked him out in one round. But we, we did stitch him up. Like he was expecting like a kid, hundred kilo guy to rock up, and I was like one hundred and fifteen, and. Geez, yeah. welcome, welcome to boxing, Hopper. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. But, and the funny thing is, he's um he's young fellow now plays for the Raiders, and he's, he's a really good kid. And he um he actually came to my fundraiser for my youth stuff. Uh, like oh really? Two and a half months ago. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. that's awesome, man. Like, did you did you find like that fight going in to it like fighting because it was a high profile fight, right? Like for Australia, yeah, it was like, huge. Yeah. Um, did you feel like? people were expecting you to go in there and and lose like was that the um, expectation you kind of felt like you were going uh, in there as a tin can for hopper or did you nah, i thought i thought the canberra crowd was like 
you wait, Benny's going to chin this dude. And yeah, I thought yeah, all right. the camera people sort of were in on, in on the secret, all the people that had seen me fight previously. But, you know, Hopper's only experience with watching me fight was that one fight when I was, you know, skinny fat instead of muscly fat. <laughs> so, he, so he's sitting there like on the k- kicking back, knocking down some beers, going, oh, mate, I'll get in there and take care of this kid. Yeah. When, when, he actually, when he actually saw you, like, for the first time, was he like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, did he nah, see that? Nah, I don't, I don't think so. I just think he uh, – it was like the crowd was just – it was awesome. Um, no, nah, I just think he was just surprised after the fight started and I caught him a few times pretty quick and the crowd was just insane. It was like mm. 99.9% of the people there were going for me. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> that's was, was cool. What do you think is like these ex-rugby league players now going in and giving their hand at, at boxing? Uh, no, and know, stuff like that? Are they just trying to grab a quick payday, do you think? Or I, you know what, I think Gallon's been open about it. And I actually sparred him. Um, in 2019 before my PFL fight. And, mate, he's, he can actually box, mate. And and he yeah. was doing Cronulla preseason at the time, and he was doing both. So that, that guy's a machine. And you know what? He said, and he said it, you know, on mainstream media, I'm here to mm. make money. And, mate, good on him. Mate, if he's, if he's in a position where he's got a platform where he can put bums on seats and make money, then, mate, good for him. He put in the hard work. He's got a great coach. Um, he's, he's he's hard to hit. He's super fit. He knows what his strengths and weaknesses are, mate. And if you're in a position to do that and make money, then good for you. I, I'm not one of these people that hates on it or whatever. No. Like obviously, there's some guys that are better than others. Like you know, Sonny Bill could box, but I don't like oh, Harry Cherry I mean, picked. I don't like Harry Cherry picked. He thought Mark Hunt was an old man. I'm happy Mark Hunt knocked him out because I hate that cherry picking fighting once every you know couple of years thing. But you yeah. know, Gallon actually jumped in there with some some tough dudes, man, and he showed a lot of ticker. In those fights, man. So out of all those footy guys, I respect Paul Gallon the most for sure. Yeah, I think I saw uh his fight when he had against Lucas Brown, Big Daddy Brown, and yeah. I thought, I, I thought because I've been an admirer of Lucas's uh, uh work for a long time, and I thought Lucas would have easily would have taken Gallon out, and I was impressed. I was just like, fuck, like, yeah. I mean, because I knew because I knew Brown wasn't going to be an easy fight, but I was like, shit. <laughs> yeah, he jumped on him quick, man. And, and you know, Lucas is uh, – I've sparred Lucas a few times over the years, and he is one of the biggest punch. And and to his credit, he always was great to spar with. We never tried to kill me. It was really controlled sparring. But you can just tell when someone has a huge shot, and he is a, a, a monster, monster puncher. So for Gallon even to accept that fight, let alone jump in there and jump on him quickly, get him out of there, it was very, very impressive. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, I definitely think it's that as well, man. But yeah, I because I saw, saw some comments from certain people in, in the boxing world that were like, "Oh, these rugby league players coming in." But again, like, man, if people are going to pay to see someone fight, like, and these good guys want to fight each other, man, who cares? Like, yeah, good <laughs> you. try like, and get on that card if you have a problem with it. You know hundred I mean? percent. Like a lot of them have jumped in there, and you know, they 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 can't throw a punch to save their life. But if they're making money, mate, good for you. Yeah, I think the only thing that you'd probably would question is like if you're getting someone in there who's like an absolute killer getting in there against like Steve Urkels. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't really want to see someone get maimed, but you know, if you're gonna see a competitive fight, let's do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. As long as long as it's evenly matched, all the, the, the rugby league guys are, are fighting, you know, challenging fights. I'm all about it. I, I don't even believe in like um like some of the, 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 the what do they call it, the, the collar, the, the charity fight nights and stuff. I don't, I don't believe in putting people in the ring or the cage that shouldn't be there. Like even yeah. like, you know, I don't, don't want to shit on any organisations or anything, but, you know, the, their whole business model is putting people in there as like a part of a weight loss journey and then you fight at the end of it sort of thing. And, you know, I'm all about implementing healthy, healthy lifestyle, you know, habits into your life, but that you can st- even if you got two people and they don't know what they're doing, you're still taking damage to your brain, you know. And I think what one 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 guy tragically actually passed away um, in in New South Wales. I think it was about eight or nine years ago, I believe. Um, and he just it was just a, a full a charity, you know, boxing night. But he, he wasn't a boxer, and you know, tragedies like that happened. And, and obviously, the government implemented a ton of. Um, safety precautions after that, which which all all fight shows have to adhere to now. 
but I just don't believe in it in its essence. But with rugby league guys, you got professional athletes jumping in there. Hundred percent. As long as they're evenly matched, they're fit, they're strong, they're tough. That's a bit different to putting a businessman in who who's lost forty kilos, who's forty five years old, jumping mm. in the ring or the cage to to get punched in the head for charity. Yeah, I mean, plus these guys are coming from a combat sport background. You know what I mean? Like they're coming from like taking heavy hits and doing yeah. this on a daily basis of training and game day and whatever. And I, and I agree. Like you know, to go into the corporate fighter thing, I, I've always had that same thing. It's like, okay, why would I actually want to go and watch these people fight? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know I mean, because let's face it, we're not going to see like a a technical masterclass. Like, yeah, this, the people are going to see it are just your family and friends. But and that's cool if that's what you want to do. But I don't know, combat like boxing, Muay Thai, MMA. It's 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 not a game. It's not something you play. You know what I mean? Like it's it's. Yeah, it's a fight for your life. And I think if you speak to any ex fighter, they're gonna have a similar sentiment. Yeah, you know, you know, we, we don't, you know, well, some fighters do, but it's not a game that you play for points. You're trying to knock the person out. You're trying to you're trying to incapacitate the person, you know. It's not um it's not a tickling contest, as Ricky Hatton used to say. <laughs> <laughs> I love Ricky Hatton. He has some of the best calls. But <clears throat> You know, it, it's – but even then, like, I, I've, I remember having a conversation uh, with a fighter and he, he actually said when he retired, it was like knowing the time to walk away. It was like I just looked at the top who, – who the top UFC champion was. And this is a guy who was in the UFC and he just went, I couldn't beat him. He goes, I, I know I'm not on his level. He goes, now it's time for me to walk away. He goes, if I can't go in there and confidently beat the champion – I shouldn't be here. And he goes, that yeah. was it. And just, I walked away. I was like, I'm done. Yeah, yeah that's great. And that's strength of character too. A lot of people, and it, even for me, I, I never really thought I was the best guy in the world. But my thing was, man, I'll, I'll fight anyone. And I, I proved that, you know, with, with Overeem and Rick Overhoven and all that sort of thing. But um, it was time for me to walk away when I was worried about getting injured. Yeah. And it's good that if someone could find the reason to walk away at the right time, I think that's a beautiful thing. Whether it's you don't think you can compete at the top level or you're worried about getting injured or you have other priorities in your life, if you can walk away at the right time and not hang on too long, I think I'll well, take my hat off to you because that's, that's, you know, for a lot of people, it's a very difficult thing to do. 100%, man. You, you mentioned uh, fighting Alistair over him. Um, he's a guy that sort of up and down throughout his career is. Um, you know, has proven to be uh, taking some substances that may or may not have been legal. Um, when you fought him, was there any thought in your mind that looking back at that, that he may have uh, oh. been partaking in, in some extra vitamins? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to put this as politely as I can without incrementing anybody uh, here. So, yeah, I look, that, he that, was, that was the year that he uh, got the nickname Uberine. So it was 2010, October oh, 2. Shit. That was Uberine. That was him and his Uberist. <laughs> but, oh, um, when he, when he, that was when he beat Lesnar, wasn't it? When he fucking so he, he fought Lesnar in 2011, in December 2011. I fought him in October 2010. So I fought him the year that he won the K1 tournament. So he, I think he got saucy in 2009, and then you know the end of 2010, he was just just an absolute specimen. He had like veins in his abs, and I think he was 116 kilos ripped. Um, but I, I got I got no beef with him at all, man. They said in our contracts with K1. They say we, we, you like capital letters. You will not get drug tested. That's always the only fat guy. <laughs> uh, so that yeah. Jesus, that's nuts. Like, is yeah. it's it, that's crazy? Because like, it, but how many times have you seen that in your career where it's like no drug test will be required? Like, is that that like, that's that's a pretty <laughs> okay? So that was only in Japan. So they yeah. wanted guys to be juiced to the fucking gills. Yeah. It's oh, like you know Europe as well. Um, <laughs> I definitely saw some saucy guys over there for like uh, super combat and, and things like that. But um, in Japan, they don't care. They just, the bigger, the better. Um, mm. Whatever looks cool on TV. You know, you got guys like Bob Sapp and they love the freak shows. And you know, that's their niche. UFC's got the best of the best. Pride mm. show, Pride in that. And used, that K1 used to put on the freak fights and stuff. And it was, mate, I loved it. I, I, I still, I still, I still watch it. Pride. I still go back and watch Pride shows. Mate, yeah, I love it. Mate, I was the, the, the most hardcore fan. I had all the, the video tapes. Loved it. So yeah. I've got no beef with over him. I wouldn't mind finding him now, though. He's, he's, he's turned into a vegan and he's super skinny. So if he wants to rematch, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we might be able to make that happen in Enduro. 
<laughs> Main event. <laughs> I, I, I'd only find it kickboxing. I think his submissions are a bit too good for me. He had a pretty good <sighs> guillotine back in the day. Yeah, man. But, um, dude, fighting over him back then, like, did you know going in there, looking at him, going, all right, this guy is on some shit? Oh, 100%. Like, it wasn't a secret. Like, my, most of the guys there were, were pretty juiced up. But um, I didn't care. I didn't care. I just, I didn't feel, feel any more nervous for that fight than any other fight. Mm. And I, I went there for 30 seconds. I said, I'm just going to try and blow this dude out of the water. And if he's still standing there after a minute, then I'll just deal with it then. And <laughs> I, was 26, I was 26 years old. Yeah. I was, I knew I was out of my depth, but I knew if I, if I landed one, I'd be sweet. But, you know, if, if I fought that fight. Life-changing you know, if you knocked him out. At least he landed. Yeah. One but you know what? If, if I was just, you know, what you know, it was way overmatched, and that's what the Japanese do. They they put the best guy with the newest guy because they want the big knockouts. They're not thinking about long term investments for for people's careers and all that sort of thing. But you know, it's cool, and they got great highlight reels. And you know, if I had that fight now or a week after the fight, it'd be a completely different fight yeah. than what it was. But being twenty six years old, I've gone from fighting in Canberra to fighting. You know, he was arguably the best fighter in the world that year. Like he was working towards. Oh, a fight with um you know Fedor at the time before he lost to the doom so you know i'm proud of that and, uh, happen. and it still made that fight got mentioned to me every week if not every day for a year after plus it still gets mentioned to me you know but it's That's it's cool well, i'm happy with it oh i see it man how did like do you find nowadays like the that sort of like the drug use per se is sort of died down a lot in the sport? Well, since USADA, you know, got involved, especially with the UFC, there's a lot of people uh, deflated <laughs> and yeah, uh, started, started losing consecutive fights uh, and gassing out and not being able to control people like they used to. And uh, I think it's great. It's just it's so hard to implement on, uh, you know, the small shows and stuff because it's such an expensive process to run. And then, you know, you've got to deal with all the, the potential lawsuits coming in and, and all that sort of thing. So it's very messy, but, you know, I think it's great what the UFC is doing. You know, I don't know how many millions a year that costs them with, with USADA to have them involved, but I think it's I think it's great for this, to have a clean sport, especially in combat sports. It's not like baseball where you're just hitting the ball out of the park and it's awesome. 100%. You know, you're bouncing brains around in there, you know, and you're banging shins and, you know, again, life-changing consequences. Do those substances, do you feel impact – a f like do you feel like a clean fighter versus a fighter that is on the gear has no chance in a fight or has a only a puncher's chance? Oh, it, it depends. A fight is a fight and anything can happen. I'm sure there's been a lot of natural guys that have been a lot of juiced up guys. But, um, you know, there's, there's so many variables in that equation, you know. There could be a, a very good fighter who's – knows he's not going to get drug tested, he's going to take steroids and be the best version of himself he could possibly be. Or you can have the insecure guy who just wants to have the big muscles to intimidate his opponent who's who's going to crack under pressure anyway, who's who's a front runner. So it just just, just depends on, on each individual person. And I'm sure, I know there's been a lot of natural guys that have been a lot of juiced up guys, but if it wasn't even playing field and everyone was juiced up, that'd be a sight to behold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, could you imagine like a, a, in the prime Brock Lesnar versus an Alistair Overeem in the prime, like just but both guys just full of gear? <laughs> yeah, well, we, we saw it. Just the only issue was it was uh, post diverticulitis Brock Lesnar where he had 11 inches of his colon removed. And he had that fight like six or seven months after like major surgery on his intestine. Yeah. And obviously Overeem just started to in, in, the, in the prime. Yeah, like that would have been awesome. But even things. but even then though, like Brock Lesnar as, as like an MMA fighter, like he wasn't really that well skilled in many areas. But like yeah. just the size of him and just you know, do you feel like it was more of his presence was more intimidating for his opponents? Well, I, I think he was like super explosive, and even like like wrestlers like that actually know wrestling, like Kurt Angle and stuff. They said mm. he wasn't the best technical wrestler, but he was just so big and so strong and so explosive. Like obviously his striking wasn't wasn't great, and he and he didn't respond well to getting hit, which obviously you know. But but just the, the presence, his attitude, his physicality, like you just put him on a poster, you're gonna sell tickets. Like the guys are absolutely, mm -hmm. he's as tall as me, um, weighs the same as me, but a little bit of uh, different uh, body characteristics. 
<laughs> but he's just so marketable, man. Like just just the beast of a man. He's just got the attitude to go with it, man. I've watched his highlights a million times and his WWE stuff as well. Mm. Like he's, he's an impressive him. looking dude. Yeah. Oh, he's a beast. Man. He's a beast of a man, and he was still going at what 44, 45 or something. I think he is. Now, I don't know if he's doing any more of the combat, like the fighting, yeah, like in the in the wrestling. I think I think oh. he's looking at wrapping things up pretty soon. But I mean, you just still see him in that kind of shape. You're gonna sell tickets, mate. He's just totally marketable. And mate, yeah. I mean, if he was if he was fighting, you know, Canberra or Sydney or, or, or WWE, I'd be watching that for sure. But he's also got a personality as well, which is like, yeah, you know, like yeah. when you see him actually being interviewed and you can see him relaxed in a setting like that where he's just sitting talking to someone. He's yeah. a like when he did the Pat McAfee uh thing, like that was hilarious. Like he was yeah. just you know, it, like I remember him you don't being see him like that often. Yeah, it's like I remember them going, Oh, we saw a fan jump the rail and run up. He goes, I fucking dare him to do it to me. <laughs> like, the guy hadn't even got the question. He's like, I fucking dare that shit. <laughs> do yeah, it to me. Fuck yeah, I love, like, oh, I love, yeah, I love this guy. But yeah. um man, I wanted to ask you as well, dude. Um, so coming up to the tw- July the 29th, Enduro Fight Series. Uh, big show. I'm going to be commentating on this. You you guys had told me uh, at the time you didn't have a name for me for a commentary partner. So I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. Like, do we have this name? What's what's the search been like to find my co-commentator for this? Well, the search continues and it's going to continue right now because we want to, we want to put a call out for someone to join you uh, on our show, July 29, and potentially shows moving forward as a color commentator. We just want someone, we're looking for someone anywhere, ACT, New South Wales, potentially further out, potentially Victoria, just anyone with a, with a passion for MMA, a bit of knowledge and a, and a, and a bit of a personality to, to bounce off yours. Uh, we are looking for someone. Um, so if you're keen, hit us up, make contact with us, and, and we'll get the ball rolling from there. So obviously, uh, on our Instagram, it's Enduro Fight Series. If you want to hit up me up personally, um, I'm sure Pierre's will put all the links and stuff on at the end yeah. of this episode. But um, yeah, we are looking for a color commentator. So if you're keen to jump in and, and give it a go, um, you know, we're open to, to giving anyone a shot, uh, male, female, as long as you're passionate about MMA and have a bit of knowledge, hit us up. I'm just bringing the uh, Enduro Fight Series on Instagram. So, guys, if you want to get in contact or you potentially want to uh, become a commentator in the world of uh, mixed martial arts, you can do that by contacting Enduro MMA. They are at Enduro uh, Enduro Fight Series on Instagram, correct? That's correct. Yep. No worries. I'm just writing that up. Um, So how... Like, what fight particularly are you excited for on this card? Uh, the main event and semi-main event, uh, the heavyweight title and, and the girls' flyweight title. Like, you know, you got you got two female amateur world champions making their pro debuts. It's pretty awesome. Like, that, that, that doesn't happen all the time to have two amateur world champions making their pro debuts together for a title. Um, you know, Danielle's just won a third title in a third weight division. And I know that famed mosquito, she looks like an absolute beast with her training videos on social media. I see she's jacked. She's fully committed. She's, it's, I think it's the IWMAF world champion versus Danielle is the Gamma world champion. Mm. So there's that. And also the, the heavyweight title, as I touched on earlier, you got Jack uh, Alexander, whose nickname's, you know, the Panther, which is that because he, the guy's a freak. He's, I think he's like 6'3", maybe 6'4", slightly taller than me. He's jacked and he's just, he's just fl- very fluid in his movements. And uh, he fought on our show, as I said, on Enduro 2, uh, made, a, made a huge impact. And you know, the crowd was super excited. And again, it's, it's the sort of Brock Lesnar thing. Like there's this big jack dude who knocks people out. And he's fighting Dean Maxwell, a f- former training partner of mine, who's um, – he's, he's <laughs> so there's a bit of a stereotype here with people from Queanbeyan. Like, you know, and I used to live there, so I'm part of this, but – yeah, yeah. They're a, a little bit a little bit out there sometimes. And, and he is a full Queenie guy. He's a little bit nuts in the most beautiful way. And he's one of those guys that he can just show up on the night and he can perform. He um he's coming off yeah, he, he he had a really severe leg break injury a couple of years ago. And he's just he's jumping straight back in. He doesn't care. He had hand surgery like six weeks ago. He's jumping in, he doesn't care. And I, I wouldn't anything could happen. This fight could be over in 10 seconds, flip a coin. You know, 
the bigger the guy, the big guys, little gloves, anything can happen. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I can't wait. But again, the whole card, man. Like I know I, I've got I've got my promoter hat on, but there's yeah, just yeah. so many guys that are just they're young and they're hungry and they've had one or two fights with one or two KOs and they're just ready to get after it, man. And they're they're, they're usually some of the best fights that we have as well. Yeah, I mean, without without a question, uh, without a doubt, and you know, to me, honestly, I'm really looking excited for this he- heavyweight fight. I'm a big heavyweight fight fan, um, and expecting to see some pretty entertaining fights on the to make the trip down from Sydney to uh, to Canberra on the 29th. Um, also just wanted to make another special mention. This is the Instagram for Enduro Fight Series. If you're seeing it on YouTube, it is Enduro Fight Series. You've got an O in there. Huh? I'm missing it's one. Enduro or? with an O. Yeah. Ah, there you go. E N D O U R O. Because it's a play on uh me and my business partner's name. His surname's Duros. Ah, right. Well, yeah. Man. Don't don't I feel like an asshole now? But <laughs> there, goes. there we go. Hey, we ain't even gonna edit that out, Ben. That's how. <laughs> hey, this it. is me, baby. This is me. Okay. Exactly. It's organic. It's Enduro Fight Series on Instagram. Go and check him out. Go contact there for tickets. Hey, and also, if you want to be my color commentator on the night, you got a bit of a knowledge about the fight game, bit of experience. You hit these guys up. You could possibly be sitting next to me. Who knows? <laughs> I'm excited, man. This is going to be a fun, fun night. Um, as we sort of start to wrap things up here, Ben, like <clears throat> for yourself here, you know, now, you know, you, you mentioned sort of stepping away from the fight game or retiring from being an in-ring competitor. How have you found being promoter compared to, you know, a competitor now being, you know, someone who's now putting on these shows what was your sort of view on promotion and, and stuff like that prior to becoming a promoter? Um, I've had some really good experiences with promoters and some really bad ones. It's, um, you know, the fight business is notorious for having dodgy people uh, involved and running an enduro fight series with my business partner, Mickey's been, it's honestly been the most challenging thing I've ever done. It's been very difficult, very stressful, but, um, you know, having a guy like him next to me who's a um, consummate businessman, he, he just knows, you know, we've, we've been mates since 2006, so we've known each other a very yeah. long time. And, you know, this show does not happen without him. And he's just been a fantastic support person for me, uh, you know, since I met him, but also, obviously, we're with Enduro. So I think we're getting, the show's, the show's evolving, you know, now we've got you involved and, you know, we'll see how we go moving forward. But we're looking at doing bigger and bigger things. But the biggest thing we wanted to do with Enduro is, you know, some of the best nights of my life were fighting at home, you know, in little old Canberra. You know, we, we don't you get, get a lot of big events here. So it's very, very cool to be able to give um, local fighters an opportunity to do that. But we also wanted to give, have all, <clears throat> have all the fighters walk away and say, yeah, those guys were good. They were legit. They were honest. They were transparent. And yeah. there's, there's no... That's, that's my biggest thing with this is I want all the fighters walking away going, those guys are legit. They're not dodgy at all. They're very transparent. They're upfront. They're honest. And, uh, you know, that that's the, that's the reputation we have and that's the reputation we're going to have moving forward. Yeah. And that's – and as you said, I think it's promoter. Hat one, yeah, in general, everyone's heard the sort of horror stories from promoters from all different forms of the entertainment and combat world, you know what I mean? So I think people have always got that thing. But, you know, for me, when I first met you, you seemed like a, a guy who was very honest, very genuine. Uh, when I was approached to work with Enduro, <clears throat> you know, combatants who, who I do a lot of work with were just singing high praises to you and Mick as well, just saying, man, like you could not go and work for nicer people, man, was basically what I was told. So yeah, not, to, not to blow smoke, but that's honestly what I was told. So Yeah, that's nice. That was probably from Ben Reid at Pretty Boy Promotions. i got to give him <laughs> some love too because he's the one who hooked us up. <laughs> hey man, what a fight night that was, bro. That was, but you know what? You, you mentioned the Canberra crowd, and that was my first time down for a cramp Canberra show in, in any sort of combat or entertainment or anything. They were my first time in Canberra for an event, and I was blown away by that crowd, man. Like that was just they were hot for every every fight. It would just seem they were on fire, and it, it's just jeed me more and more up for enduro. Yeah, mate, we're very, very passionate. You know, we love our sport down here, and you know, there's not too many uh, 
you know, there's, there's no big concerts or anything going on here. There's, you know, so when, when there's a big fight night on, we're, they're, we're keen as mustard to get to it and to support their local fighters. Oh, that's it, man. So, hey, everyone, make sure you go and get your tickets for July 29th because you know it's going to be a banger down in Canberra. But, um, you know, where can everyone find you uh, on social media and also on uh, with Enduro as well? Do you guys have any other social media platforms? That we can uh, so I'm at uh, Ben the Gov. It's B-E-N-T-H-E-G-U-V. Um, we, we've spelt it in the uh, the British way uh, <laughs> as, as the original <laughs> governor. Web boy. Um, yeah, just hit me up on there at Ben the Gov on Instagram. Yeah, there you yeah, go, guys. Series, yeah, um, yeah, everything all you need is through, through there on Facebook and stuff as well. That's all linked to the Instagram, so we'll just go through that. We've also got the YouTube, uh, Enduro Fight Series page as well. If you want to give us a follow on there, we, we upload all of the fights. We've got a few awesome highlight reels. We've just done our first um highlight reel for all of our finishes as a bit of a competition to win oh, some prizes nice. by uh hgg the home gym guys who've uh, been a fantastic sponsor of us in the past and will continue to be moving forward so yeah give us a follow give us a like hey head over there click those buttons guys Make sure you check the description because we'll have all links in below, but also make sure you go and check out our sponsor, sleefs.com. Use that promo code MWA pod to get a 10% discount. Now, Ben, I end every podcast asking the same question. I'm going to ask you that question now. What is the one question I didn't ask you in this podcast that you wish that I did ask you? And if I had asked you said question, how would you have answered it? How did I transition from fighting? How did I transition out of retiring into normal life? Okay. And how would you have answered that? <laughs> I sort of answered it anyway. I'm just, yeah, I couldn't think of anything. But you know what? Like, I, I figured we answered that in there. Like, did you like, yeah, yeah I haven't looked back since. And I'm I like, just, oh, I, I just wanted to make you feel bad for a second. But then you're like, no, nah, you got it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was sitting there going, oh, you motherfucker. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I'm going to have fun working with you, I can tell. But, uh, guys, make sure you go and check out Enduro Fight Series. Check out Ben the Gov on Instagram as well. But until next time, this is Piers Austin, and I am with – one of my favorite people in the entire world. And I know that I say that about everyone, but this time this person can actually beat the living shit out of me. So I actually mean it. Ben, the governor, Edwards, thank you for being on. It's been great to see you and uh, look forward to seeing you on the 29th. Really appreciate it, mate. Thank you. No problem. Take care. See you guys. Peace.